The greatest power you possess is your ability to choose. Join Lowe's Moore as he reveals how you can begin to maximize that power by exploring yourself on the deepest levels and committing to making lasting and positive changes. Get ready to achieve breakthroughs that will lead to accelerated growth and transformation because you are now tuned in to The Blueprint. Good evening and welcome back to The Blueprint Podcast. Um, again, I'm excited. I'm excited to really be back with you guys. Um, the last few shows, um, last week I had my wife, my wife, I had never been interviewed on my podcast. I don't know why I would be interviewed on my own podcast, but my wife made a suggestion that, uh, man, you need to be interviewed. And, and of course, uh, she interviewed me last week, a little weird, um, you know, taking it, taking the questions rather than asking the questions uh, turned out really well. A lot of people viewed. Thank you for your support. Uh, each and every week, uh, you guys viewed last week. It was amazing. And you, man, the, the one before that with the, uh, interim super superintendent, uh, doc, man, she, she, we got a lot of support on that. Uh, a lot of interest in, in that. I was excited about that part in regards to education and how my how personally uh, my school district was actually doing and what was the future and what was the vision that you know that was awesome man it was it, it was very good uh a very good podcast so let me say thank you to each and every one of you guys for your support every week um it, it was just really nice it's nice every week to see the support that I get. And it was interesting. I, I was at my wife and I uh, attended the uh, Bronx Basketball Hall of Fame. Now, you know, in New York, there are a lot of legends, you know, Pee Wee Kirkland, uh, Joe Hammond, uh, you know, just some, you know, of course, Kareem, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, uh, all the guys that played at Rucker, Rucker Park and yeah, I got a chance to see last year. I was there for the first annual Bronx Basketball Hall of Fame and Nate Tiny Archibald was inducted into the Hall of Fame as well as Rod Strickland and uh, Ricky Sobers. And this year, uh, Stephen Shepard, uh, the bear from Maryland University and also Butch Lee was on it and, and many others were on it. But uh, there is such a powerful legacy uh, in regards to New York basketball. And, you know, I had an opportunity because I had a cousin that lived in the Bronx and of course I had a cousin that lived in Brooklyn. And so when I went to the Bronx uh, as a little kid, I, I saw a tiny on, on the playground, just, you know, just destroying people uh, back in the, you know, back in the day. And I was like, wow, man, when I grow up, man, I want to be like that guy, man. He was a young guy himself, but I was like, oh man, he was just, you know, taking the part by storm. And then as I got a little older and, and, and made my high school team and I went to Brooklyn with my uh, with my brother, and then there was Fly Williams. I seen Fly Williams out there and I got a chance to go into the playground and, and play against at that time Bernard, uh, Bernard King. And then his younger brother, Albert King, was like kind of in the middle. I'm in the middle of them. And, and so the competition was real. You know, it was it was real competition. I was really proud to be able to attend uh, the Bronx Basketball Hall of Fame, and because there's so many playground legends, and there are so many players that have come out of New York, particularly the Bronx, uh, and that made it to the NBA. So yeah, it was just really exciting to be there, meet some guys that uh, I, you know, I didn't play against, but just had an opportunity to see them and meet them. And then some guys I, 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 you know, I played against, of course, I played in the Rucker, each one, teach one, Whitney M. Young uh, played with the Gauchos back in the day. And so, yeah, I, you know, I was proud of that experience, you know, to be able to go and compete what we all consider is the best, you know. Uh, and, and so and then, they, you know, my Vernon being able to create their own their own legend as well. So, uh, yeah, that was just exciting. So real quickly, I want to, um, you know, kind of say a couple of things. Number one, I want to say thank you again for your support of the blueprint podcast, uh, each and every week. 
Uh, if you're on, uh, remember, if you haven't subscribed, please do go to YouTube and subscribe uh, and like. And if you're on Facebook, you know, make sure you like. Uh, do that for me because uh, it help, helps me to grow, helps the podcast to grow. And again, I say thank you. I appreciate you all. Uh, so let me drop this. This is my seed, right? My It's not a seed. This is my miniature basketball. I drop it each and every week, right? I just dropped it. I'm expecting a ripple effect. Uh, as you know, as you know that uh, Denzel, you know, Denzel Washington, uh, in my book uh, that you see behind me, uh, he always said that my life and uh, was like a, a, a seed or a pebble right and you put it in a pond you throw the pebble in the pond but you just don't know the ripple effect right so as i made a ripple effect as a basketball player and then at formerly as an executive director of the boys and girls club and hopefully with the blueprint we'll continue to have ripple effects where we change people's lives where we uplift people right where we encourage people uh, and and uh, I think for the last a little over four years, we've been doing trying to do just that: encourage people, bring joy to people, and and give people, uh, you know, especially the individuals that come on the podcast, you know, uh, they have their own stories. It it's it's amazing, man, when they have their own stories and how they have impacted so many of you, and you and you told me about it when I see you, or you make comments down at the bottom. Remember, it's interactive, so you can ask questions, send comments, and we'll do our best to ask, answer every one of them. Uh, let me finally say this. I got two things I need to say real quick. At the Bronx Basketball Hall of Fame dinner on uh, last, last week, it was a gentleman. He said, look, when I'm somewhat discouraged and uh, I go... I check out your podcast each week, right? I'm on there every every week. And he's always making comments, whether he's seen it live or whether he's seen it later on, he's always making, he said, you, in, you know, your podcast encourages me, right? And that's the thing that we want to, that's the thing we want to achieve, right? Uh, with the, that's the purpose of the podcast, right? Is, is to help people, to empower people and to help people make, positive and powerful choices you know and then so secondly um I, I want to say this i had a chance to speak at a high school uh in westchester and you know i, I got a uh you know an opportunity to kind of share with these young people and i asked them a simple question and and maybe you guys can can answer this tonight uh if you're on here if you do me a favor right can you tell me you know just maybe two or three of them what are your core values right what are your core values right what's important to you in regards to, because i think somewhere in the world we live now i don't think we know what our core values are i mean for me you know one one important one was of course integrity trust right perseverance honesty friendship i mean there there are a lot more but what are your three top core values you know and and because it kind of sets the stage for your life and then if you look at the united states of america and you look at the world and you were to ask what is what is their what is our core values Right. When you because I think we've kind of lost our way a little bit. So uh, that's that's my question for the week. And so let me jump right into it and let me give you my book of the week. All right. So the legends of the Lakers. Right. I guess top 75. Right. Top 75 greatest Laker players, man. I'm an awesome book right so many you know lakers has such a great great history right and uh you know one of my of course favorites of you know all time is is of course will chamberlain you know still holding a million records in, in the nba uh we're going to talk to one of the legends of of the lakers 
But man, what what a powerful legacy uh, they have. And it's a tremendous book with so many wonderful, so many wonderful stories, so many wonderful players. Right. And sometimes we only see ball players and we don't see we don't see people. We don't see human beings. But every one of those 75 players are human beings and very special people. So uh, if you don't, hey, even if you're not a Laker fan, you should have this on your bookshelf. I give the book, I give books of the week and word of the week because I want people to build a library, a library in their home. Yeah, you should. I don't have mine up yet, but I got books. I got a million books, but I just got to get the bookshelf. Right. And because uh, I'm about to do that before Christmas. So uh, I may show it to you all the next time I'm on there. And then here's my word of the week. Right. Uh, showtime. Right. And, uh, you know, of course, that was a big deal in the culture of the Los Angeles Lakers back in the day. But it was also one of my favorite words, because uh, when I was a little guy, you know, playing basketball, we used to always play this fundamentally sound basketball. We could do no tricks. We could do nothing fancy. None of that. It was just fundamental basketball, defense and offense. You you couldn't like, you know, doing the shimmy and all that kind of stuff. But back in the day, man, my coach did not tolerate that. Right. But with about two or three minutes left in the game, if we were blowing a team out, man, we would turn in. He would I would hear a voice say showtime like that and and then we started doing the through the legs we started doing the Harlem gold trotters we started throwing the ball around our neck and around our back right so before the lakers had showtime right when i was a little kid we had showtime you know you couldn't after a while you couldn't do it anymore because they would say you were showing off the team you know or showing up that team right but i could not wait until we got the lead and and he and hear the coach yell showtime right so that's my word of the week and here's my affirmation my pierce hopper hill hopper affirmation quote moment right let me jump right in into it this come from kobe bryant once you know what failure feels like determine to trace success i like that once you know what failure feels like determination chases success so hey of course we know kobe was very determined so uh that's my affirmation uh for the week and here's my movie and and uh, music for the week ah. now i don't have no music on but i think my music of the week is there Uh, do we have the music and movie? Well, I know. Let, let me let me tell you one of them. Uh, the music of, of the week from um, from the movie Fame is the movie of the week, right? And then Irene Cara, the music on my own is the music of the week. If we can't find find it, but that's the music of the week. Irene Cara on my own. Man, I used to play that song all the time. And then I, of course, right, I had one, not one of the first VCRs back in the day, but I used to play the movie Fame all the time, right? Uh, I was just excited about Fame and that you could have certain gifts and talents and that you could go to school and do that, like write music, sing music, dance, play, play music. Yeah, you could act. Yeah, I, 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 I love that. And even I like the new version of Fame. Uh, I like that one, too, as well. So and and so, yeah, let's move forward. I got my person and persons of the week, right? I, my persons of the week, Norm Nixon and Debbie Allen, right? Uh, they are my persons of the week. I'm sure we in a few minutes we'll hear a little bit more. And but they're my persons of the week. And and uh you know i'm so yeah let's 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 just move on we because i don't want to get into my interview uh i want to celebrate tonight richard roundtree right uh for as an african-american male as a black man right uh 
you know, if we didn't see like our grandfathers, our fathers, or men in front of us in our local neighborhood, right? Uh, we may deem them as heroes, uh, of course, athletes, but in terms of manhood and masculinity and, and, and toughness, right? Uh, you know, uh, Richard Roundtree, man, for a lot of you, I'll say me and many others, what for, for were here he was a hero to us right when we saw a shaft man we was like man we could stand up for our rights you know we we bad right because shaft was bad and we always we always wanted to grow up we always wanted to be like shaft we want to walk in the street and have the car stop and all that kind of stuff like that i want to say rest in peace man um man you were one of our shining black stars you know, and, and man, you're going to be truly missed. You were still doing it right. Just not too long ago. You were still doing it. So let's, so let's move on, but, uh, we celebrate you. And I want to say, my wife is saying, uh, I want to say congratulations to, uh, you know, my wife who became assistant pastor. Um, now not, let, not this weekend, last weekend. And she wants to say thank you to everybody. And that, uh, you know, a, she's there because all the glory belongs to god you know so yeah we 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 were sharing that information and it finally happened and it was a wonderful wonderful time and it was truly it was truly appreciated and uh man it was awesome so so uh yes she's an ap not assistant principal right she's she's assistant pastor and to my father right uh heavily birthday to my father Lowe's more senior um yeah he's been gone a little while now but uh we still remember him right and then to my my granddaughter who turned two on that same date as my grandfather not my grandfather my father partly turned two. the boss yeah the boss baby she turned two all right and then uh to my oldest granddaughter amaya her birthday is 11 2. we got a lot of ooh, a lot of november baby 11 11 2. Uh, amaya i spoke to her on the phone she's like a grown she's in atlanta she's like a grown woman man she's talking to me like uh ooh, like a little lady i was like awesome man i asked all them questions she answered them right and i want to say happy birthday happy birthday to you amaya yes all right man and uh on november the 12th um we got ray ray nagon uh man wonderful and powerful story man i mean this this is this is gonna be amazing uh as a 17 year old boy he committed a crime outside the yankee stadium i don't know if you guys heard of this the bat boy he, he committed a crime out and was caught by George Brian, George Steinbrenner himself, right? And rather than calling the police on him, he gave him a job, right? He made him a bat boy. And so for over 30, 30 or more years, from a, from a bat boy to an executive and an author, right? Uh, you know, he's been in the Yankee organization. He has a tremendous story. I'm looking forward to to uh bringing it to you guys next week and then i guess this is finally i got one more here who's coming soon okay we got the whiz the whiz uh we're presenting the whiz the revelators on saturday november the 18th at five o'clock and sunday november the 19th uh, make sure you get your tickets. Make sure that you are there to support these young people. They are marvelous. They are wonderful. Right? The Wiz. All right. What we got next? And then Reginald Howard. Um, speaking of Bat Boy, he was a Bat Boy as a little as a, as a little boy. He was a Bat Boy in the Negro leagues and he's in his nineties clear of thought. He's going to be with me along with a friend 
on November the 19th, man, it's going to be, it's going to be awesome. He's going to talk about the Negro league and not only being a bat boy in the Negro league, but playing in the Negro league, man. Yeah. We're going to get a little history that day. Right. So let's get rolling. Uh, show, I'm going to show you a couple of videos and then I'm going to introduce my guests for this evening. Now, Vernon had a stretch with all those guys, with Rudy and the McCray brothers and Gus and Ray and that whole period of time that basketball was at its peak. Basketball has been a very bright light for Mount Vernon and Mount Vernon has been a very bright light for the basketball. Mount Vernon. <laughs> <laughs> Took Creevy right up with him. Earl Tatum, he can shoot. The ball. Ray Williams. Oh, through this fourth quarter. Give it Jones. Here is Scooter McGray. Big trap court. This is for the tie. Oh. Riker reaching in. Blocked by Jim McGray. Gus Williams hits from outside. He's got the ball. He's got 49 points. He puts it up. And no! just won the world championship. Norm, I'm going to tell you something, man. This club is one heck of a basketball team. Well, I tell you, this is the greatest team I've ever played on. Uh, I really don't think there are any teams that can beat us when we're at our best. And the champagne is going to flow. Oh, the champagne is flowing, and tonight is going to be a great night. My family's been a big influence on everything that I've done. You know, my mother was a mom in the community where all my little friends and the ones older than me, they could always come to my house to eat, but she would not accept any kind of disrespect or bad behavior in the house. You learn that if you go into places and you show respect, the respect is returned. Some of those qualities are in me. You know, I have tons of kids come here. My kids have to support it. My wife has to support it, and I think to have someone like myself and Debbie, it's a great thing to be able to be in a position to provide that. It's so important that we're honoring Norman tonight because he's such a civic community servant. He worked so hard to reach out to young people, inspire them with his legacy, and he goes outside of his own world of sports to improve the quality of life of other people. If it's that one person that you changed their life, that's a big deal. I think Norm embodies the best that Los Angeles has to give. Uh, he is a great ambassador for himself, for the city, and you know, Norm is a Renaissance man. And that sort of uh, graciousness and the ability to deal with people and put an argument forward uh, and win people over uh, is, is a thing of the past and uh, Norm has that old school about him. I think the more we focus on educating our youth, the better people they become because then they understand the surroundings, they understand the situation they're in. And I think when you have that foundation, education, family, when those things are working for you, those kids in their adult lives will be more than likely to come back to those communities and become beacons of light for those communities and become role models for those communities help those communities. And I think when you go in and you do things like that, I think you see the effect you have on them. And so for me, that's, that's very uh, satisfying. I find him to be one of the most genuine human beings that I ever met. All over the world, wherever we go, people stop him, talk to him from as far away as Tel Aviv to as far away as Sydney. He has fans everywhere. His greatest contribution to Los Angeles is still in the making. I mean, you gotta say he's the incredible point guard, all-star. But to have the image of a young man who has grown up in this industry and is still so close to his children, still married to his wife, that's who he is. That's a great image. That's a real person. What's up, Norm? How you doing, man? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good, man. I'm good to say, who is that guy they introducing? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's you, man. That's you. <laughs> nah, that was lovely, man. 
I, you know, I was listening to it the other day, right? I was just going through it and I was like, oh man, you, you bringing a tear to my eye, man. You know, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was cool, man. I love it. And before we get going, I want to talk about the connection because you, the first video I played, Four Square Miles of Glory, it hasn't come out yet, but you, you, you spoke on there. And I, I, I want to talk about the connection, you know, because I played against you in you're college yeah 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 i was I, you was at duquesne i was at west virginia and and uh you know when you look at that you know that video because you're talking about earl tatum oh yeah right yeah yeah you took you and you're talking oh, about ray we'll, we'll start we'll start out with you i remember this okay coming in at west virginia and i was like man who is this little guy I actually turned into a fan, so I watched your career at West Virginia because I wanted to see what your trajectory was going to be because I thought you were a great young player. And I left the game. I mean, is this little dude left-handed? Is he right-handed? Because that's very <laughs> rare when you find guards that have the um, the foresight or the wisdom to to uh, work on their offhand and go the opposite direction. That That is a separated sport, in particular with guards, where you can really handle the ball with both hands. And you had that at a young age, and it was something I was really impressed by because most guys don't really understand that. So that's your wow. story. That's my story. <laughs> and, yeah. Now, to Mount Vernon, yeah, Mount Vernon had a great run, man. I played against all those guys that, that popped up on their screen. I mean, great players. I mean, Gus and I battled out here in Western Conference Finals. I think they won the championship my first year. Um, Gus and DJ in the backcourt, and it was just – you know, me playing with Lou Hudson and some older guards. So my third year, Magic and Cooper finally came. So I had two young guys to run with me so I can run against Gus and DJ because <laughs> it wasn't fair playing with older guards and having to deal with these two young guys, man. And one last thing, I told I told Denzel this, Gus took the crossover out of my game, he and DJ. I mean, they picked me a couple of times. I'm like, man, I can't even cross over on these guys. So I had to slow down and just try to outrun them. So it was a really interesting thing, you know. <laughs> yeah. You guys had a great run, man. Yeah, and it was interesting when I was a little kid. Uh, you know, coming up, Gus was in college. Yeah, I went to college and then followed Gus in high school. And, you know, I had become decent myself, you know. So we were playing at the club. And I was coming down like, you know, like, oh, you okay you Gus but I'm you know like I'm Lowe's you know you know what I'm saying you know and so I'm coming I'm dribbling the ball and I look at everybody and they started instead of you know following me they start running this way and I'm like and so Gus is guarding me and I'm dribbling the ball and I'm like where y'all running to I got the ball like I didn't I didn't have the ball he he, 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 he just <laughs> But the same thing about Ray, my senior year, they used to have the Far West Classics. They didn't really have this uh, Chicago shootout of the thing they do with the Far West Classics. And we were playing in um, Hawaii. And, you know, again, I'm like you. I pride myself on my little handle, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, Ray was there. Jack Sickman was there. All these guys, so they were all in my class. So Ray came down court. You know, I had played with him a little bit. I said, okay, I'm getting ready to get him now. So I faked <laughs> him. He crossed over. I got him, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking to go get my layup. I did this, man. I turned around. He had picked me, picked me back that quick. I was like, who is this? I started looking at his back to see his name. Man, who is this guy that just picked me clean like this? But, uh, no, man, those are those some great players that you you talked about. And, and when you speak of Nate Archibald, he was one of my favorite guys because I was a little guard like you. And uh, he was a guy I saw putting it down when I watched him. And I'm like, oh, man, I – I like this little guy. You can go out and play. So he was the guy that gave us that kind of hope that we could make it uh, on a love, another level and really be effective and good players. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So 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 great, man. To uh, um, you know, to see so many young, especially like Tiny man, and he had a, had heart surgery, and I got a chance to see him uh, last year, uh, and uh, he was doing really really well and. You know, still they was talking about in the Bronx. You know, they always talking, man. Oh, they, so all you New Yorkers. That's all you New Yorkers talk <laughs> about. I, I, I was from West Virginia. I, I was from um from Westchester, New York. So yeah. I'm right outside it's the Bronx. The same. It's you, the you, same. Yeah, it's the same I'm thing. And all you guys together, you know, all that, <laughs> all this herky jerky. I, I was listening to you and your your talk earlier. See, I, I came from a high school that was all fundamentals. 
We never went showtime. It was fundamentals, fundamentals. If you went behind your back and you didn't have to, you're going to snatch, well, basically going to snatch out a game. Depending right. on who you were. But, but, you know, we just didn't do that. Man, we were so straight fundamental. And I think that was the reason I, I played on every level I went to. I mean, when I started at Duquesne my freshman year, because I was a fundamental guy. I knew how to run the fast break. I could recognize when you're in a 2 one two zone, one two two zone. Was a one three one trap? What was this? How do you break the press? So all those fundamental things I had as a a, a young guy, and and those are the some of the main reason. Well, are the main reasons I think I started on every level. Well, yeah, no, you 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 were awesome. I I tell you, um, <laughs> and I I think you know in our games our, our games against each other, I played well. I came mm. off the bench. Yeah, but I played well, and and you you were doing your thing, man. And uh, you, you know, was, me my senior year, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you were, you were, yeah, yeah, you were rolling, man. You you were well, rolling. What, uh, what's his name? Was the coach? The coach Bob. Um, who was uh, who was the point guard? Who were the guards for you guys? Uh, uh, Bobby Huggins Bobby and Huggins. and Tony Robinson. Yeah, Bob, yeah, both of them. <laughs> Tony actually came out to L.A. with me. He was drafted by the Lakers. But um, Huggins, I remember Huggins. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were me too. But now, yeah. Uh, but I tell you another thing about my Vernon too. I voted for Rodney McRae for All Pro every year. Mm. I don't know how many years he made it, but every year I thought he was the best small forward, one of the best in the game because of his ability to get up and down the court, his defense, his ability to rebound, his ability to score. So he was a guy. When I was a free agent, I was hoping Houston signed me because they had Rodney and they had all those guys. I was like. <laughs> Man, I have such a – and that was when Ralph and Akeem were young. But you had Rodney McCray, Rodney Reed, uh, Robert Reed, and all these guys, Lewis Lloyd, that I thought were just good players. And I was like, man, I would love to go play with those guys. <laughs> but I voted for Rodney, and I told him that when I saw him. Every year I voted for him. Wow. I don't think, I don't think the fans and people recognize, but, you know, Rodney got tough rebounds. You look at the stat sheet, nothing knocked you out, but it will be 10 rebounds. It will be 14 points. It will be two block shots. It will be a steal. And mm -hmm. that other effect that he had on the game, you wouldn't know, but he's in, he invariably guarded the toughest forward on the opposing team. So I loved his game. Yeah, I was I was talking to Rodney last night because you know Mount Vernon always show up in different places. So right, right, right. <laughs> so they Rodney's in Houston, and yeah. uh, last night uh, a friend of mine, I got a call from him, Walter Kirkland. He graduated with me. He was a track star at Mount Vernon, and then one of the other guys that played football. They end up at a golf outing for the Moses Malone Foundation. Mm. Three Mar Vernon guys. So now I get a I get a FaceTime call from Rodney, you know, and Walter. And he's like, "Yeah, Mar Vernon's in the house." You know, like <laughs> <laughs> you can't go nowhere. You can't you find somebody from Mar Vernon. <laughs> and yeah, and no, uh, I, that was that was that was a good run you guys had. Yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate it. And then um, you know. Uh, the other connection is like I could not believe, right, uh, with Denzel, right, D. So I would I was on the phone with him, right, and we talking, you know, catching up and stuff like that. And so D don't never text you. We always know he he ain't gonna text you, right. He he might call you, but he ain't gonna text you, right. I've never seen him Facetime, right. So so when uh. <laughs> when he got off the phone with me i i think he went to dinner with you 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 guys went to dinner or something like that and he right. must have said like hey man you know i was just talking to low low lows more and then he he tried to facetime me i'm like <laughs> <laughs> i'm just like a miracle just happened <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah man. No, he's he, he's mount vernon through and through man yeah he's through yeah. and through mount vernon you know? <laughs> but but before we go too much farther i i, I like to just Put this out i was talking to bob mcadoo this morning and they told me walter davis passed away man wow I'm not sure if you heard it i didn't hear it yeah i heard walter davis i mean look i can't confirm it uh mm -hmm. bob mcadoo told me i don't think he would tell me something that wasn't true i heard uh he passed away a couple of days ago man so i want to just say that and send my condolences to walter's family because he was my class as well my year as well coming out of college man what a great player oh yeah a like player. a greyhound <laughs> that's what they called him that's what they called him the yeah Woo, he could shoot oh my god he was smooth yeah right yeah anyway, man I want to just interject that man 
Yeah, man. My my condolences as well, man. Uh, yeah. And and I was just looking up something. I seen his, uh, I was reading something on him. I think they had it in, um, I seen a picture of him in the alumni legends. Right. Mac magazine. They had, they had a picture of him. I hadn't seen Walter in, in some, so some time. When I, when I was talking to Bob McAdoo, I was telling him, I said, the year we got drafted, one of the best years ever. Um, I think I'm not even sure who, who won Rookie of the Year. You had Marcus, Walter Davis, and Bernard King. All of those guys averaged over 20 points when we were rookies. Wow. And then I averaged about 14 and in, in top five in assists and steals. But we had Jack Sigma. You had Ray Williams. You had all those guys I just named. James Edwards. Mm. Cedric Maxwell. Uh, all of those guys were like in my 77 class and had great great years yeah that was awesome man you know you had a great you had a great year that was kenny carr from uh north carolina all those guys and it was like that that was a great crew that came out in 77. yeah grown men too <laughs> you guys like well, grown men well before you know when we came out Lowe's, you know if you got drafted the first round they expected you to play it wasn't about you coming in they're going to develop you for four years you know, they drafted me as a point guard. They expected me to come in and play, but not That's quite right. in my situation because they drafted Brad Davis ahead of me. I don't know if you remember Brad from University of Maryland. Yeah, with John I Wilson. did. <laughs> yeah, so I remember drafted, Brad. They drafted Brad ahead of me, so I guess they was expecting me to play behind Brad. Uh, was yeah. it my plan? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that was their plan. You know, <laughs> yeah, but, but when you came in, and you were first-round draft choice. It was none of this. We're going to draft you and develop you and wait for you for three years. They drafted you and they wanted you to come in and not only just play, but be effective playing. Right. And so it was, it was a different approach back then. Yeah. It looked like my wife found something on uh, Walt yeah, Davis. On the second. Mm. Man, what a player, man. If y'all don't, you know, you know what I, you know, Norm, you know what I, I don't like is like, it's tough to say, you know, this and these guys are great today i mean you know oh yeah, oh yeah 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 i mean you know comparisons and all those kind of things like that man man there's so many great players uh well, so i'll let you finish your thought but, but yeah I'm with that. i think you have to go errors because um you know i i talked to a lot of the older guys to play before me and when you ask them who was the best like I came in the 77. So if you talk about the sixties and early sevens, you ask them who was the best, they tell you Oscar Robinson, mm. hands down, all of them. They don't say any other name. Who was the best Oscar? And you go, why? Cause Oscar was six, five, six, six strong, get wherever he wanted to on the court and control the game. And that's unusual for guard to control the game. Cause in my era, it was about the big guys. I mean, they can say Larry Bird, they can say Magic, they can talk about all these other guys from like late seventies up until the nineties. It was Kareem, hands down, man. He oh, dominated yeah. the game. You couldn't, you couldn't do it. And they talk, well, Kareem couldn't play in this era. Era, I go, Kareem would average a hundred points. <laughs> you <couldn't touch laughs> if you could, they can't touch each other. I mean, when yeah. I came in the league, they can hand check. You, they could literally grab you and hold you. You know, now these guys can't touch each other. So can you imagine playing? Even you, just imagine with your ability to get to the basket. Nobody could touch you. Oh, man. If yeah, they touch you with a free throw line. I mean, I go with me. I'm like, man, I would have so many more points if they couldn't touch me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, w I was having this conversation the other day, right, where I said, like, you know, the big difference of a guy, and because I, I had mentioned Ray, but a guy could put his hand on your waist and guide you where you wanted to go and Grab if you weren't you. yeah if you wasn't strong enough to get loose you couldn't play in the league long i mean you know because they could just do whatever you want and ray was the great man oh. if ray put his hand on you you're done yeah you, you're, you're not going you're anywhere <laughs> I, I, I play that's why i had to try to be in great shape because i wasn't gonna let them put their hands on me. they used to tell me slow down stop i said oh no you're not getting your hands on me because once they grabbed you man it was over you yeah, know, John Williams. You know, John. Oh John yeah, from New yeah. York or from Connecticut. He's, he's in New York. Isn't he? He's from he's Connecticut. Connecticut. John Williams. Okay. Right. They went to yeah. Wilbur Cross. Yeah, you know, you got yeah. Big John and these kind of guys grab you. Silas oh, yeah. to play guard. It's like, man, you don't want these guys touching you. I uh, know. You, you better know, get away from them. 
Yeah, you try to be I'm out there running all the time, trying to get away from it. Yeah. But it's but a man, different game now. You know, yeah, it is a different game. Yeah. yeah, it's a different game. I mean, um, when we were coming up, the fans loved the way we play. Right. And you know, today's fans love, you know, yeah. we don't like it as much, but I mean, fans today they want to see the entertainment value of it. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool, man. Well, we, I mean, well, we didn't shoot threes. I mean, they, they've taken the big guys out of the game now. And, uh, I think that's one of the reasons we, uh, having so many problems on the international level when they swallow those whistles and they allow those big guys and those Eastern European guys, those guys from, you know, Serbia, those, there's some big guys, man, six, 10, seven feet. They swallow whistles. They beat our little guys up. When we played before, we always had big men. But we also mm. use our athletic ability to 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 push a tempo. We could play up tempo, then we could slow the game down and play physical. These guys, I don't think, play physical because we mimic the European game too much. We want seven foot guys to shoot threes. You know, if you play on the box, you can't play in the league now. So we'll, you know, that's a problem. I think that's yeah. a problem. That's why the international international players have caught up with us so fast. Yeah, and and then the other thing, we don't run plays either, so <laughs> we don't know who the ball going to. You like, hey, you shoot it. <laughs> oh, big, no, big guy get a rebound and dribble up court, man. If my center grabbed the ball, was running up court, man. I'll be on him so fast, but man, if you don't give me this ball and get down court, <laughs> you know, you see the seven foot guy get the rebound and push it. It's like, and usually yeah. at the end of it, they don't make great decisions. Like, I'm not going to put all of them in that bucket. But, uh, but invariably, you know, they get in the middle and don't make the best decisions with the balls, you know. So it's like, man, give me the ball. Let me do my job. Yeah, that's right. The paint, I'll give it back to you. you know? so oh, it's, man. It's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah, it is very interesting, you know. But we love basketball, so we, we continue yeah. to watch it. <laughs> you, yeah. 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 So real quickly, as we digress for a moment, man, I was listening to the uh, video, man. I want you to go back a little bit and talk about you know, growing up, mom and dad, and and uh, if they're siblings, talk about that. Talk about it around the importance of family. Talk talk about it around the importance of education, and then around faith. Talk about those three things growing up. Well, growing up, uh, we grew up in the South, so um, I'm still like a couple of years removed, but. Everything was still segregated when I was younger. I'm about a year or two removed from where it really had a major impact on me. I do remember my mother going in back doors, and but we were segregated and we didn't care. You know, we enjoyed being our friends. We just didn't go in the white neighborhoods. We stayed in the black neighborhoods. We lived in shotgun houses. We all went to church. I was having this conversation with somebody recently. Uh, churches played a different role, I think, back then. They were one of the few places you could gather, so they were. They were not only the place where you go get your spiritual food from, but it was a place where you went politically. The meetings always took places in churches because it was the only place that you could gather without mm. uh, getting in trouble. Legally, it was one of the few places. So most of the meetings, when you talk about the civil rights movement and all those things, they happen in churches. Uh, churches at those times, like, uh, for example, when my stepfather was sick, somebody from the cheese, he was going to get two or three hot meals a week. They were going to go check on him. They were going to see about him. They announced it in church on Sundays. Uh, from an education perspective, because we were segregated, I went to church with a lot of my teachers, my, my elementary school teachers, my principal went to church with me. And so, you know, coming from the same church, and you can relate to this, we went to the same church and we did something. It was like, Oh boy, I know you didn't do it. <laughs> you know, didn't expect somebody else. They look at me, so I got it twice because I went to church with it. Oh, I I know you did. <laughs> Three or four of my teachers went to church with me. So church is was not only the hub for your spiritual food, but it was for community. It was a political hub, uh, and it was just a place we went every Sunday. There was no question what you're going to do, and sometimes during the week. Educationally, uh, my era. Uh, my generation, a lot of us were the first ones to go to college because uh, mm. a lot of them didn't have uh, the opportunities. And um, education at that time was one of the um, few ways to break that cycle. Guys went in the military, they came out, they got the VA loan. 
we had to go on academics, not academic scholarships. We had to go on sports scholarships. So they wouldn't give us academic scholarship. I had a couple of friends that did get over that hump and get academic scholarship, but it wasn't as available to us as it was everybody else, regardless of your grades or regardless of what you did. So education was one of those places where we uh, put a lot of emphasis on because it was one of the equalizers for us where you could go out and get, quote, a better job. But when you look at those jobs, it was being a teacher, it was being a lawyer, it was being a doctor. It wasn't being entrepreneurial. So now I think what has happened with education now is kind of taking a turn. They're not necessarily saying that a four-year degree is the best way because there's so many other things we need to uh, learn about. We need to be financial literate. We need to understand the stock market. We need to understand entrepreneurship. And a lot of times people that venture in those areas don't necessarily have all the degrees. Some do. And... Uh, and some don't, but <clears throat> I still encourage my kids to have it because I was aging at one time. And um, my son was like, well, dad, you know, you didn't use your degree. I said, well, I would have never been able to be an agent if I hadn't had my degree. That right. is my degree. Uh, am I using that degree now? Probably because of the discipline, but I was a math guy. And so I think having a degree in those days only meant that you were somebody that had discipline that you could start and finish something. So mm -hmm. the landscaping is kind of changing now. So education for me now, meaning means you have to go to school and get what you can get, but you still have to seek that education outside of the normal channels, like understanding your history, understanding who you are, understand all the successes in our neighborhood, looking at, you know, like, not only just looking at say, those guys that we love, uh, like Archibald and, and all these guys, but we need to look at, you know, who was uh, 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 John Henry Clark. You know, you have to look at mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Ben. You got to know who Harriet Tubman was, who all these people were, what were their effects, what did they do? So we do understand that a lot of our situation that we in is a direct result of of our past and our history. But when you come to grips with that, you won't use an excuse, but you you have to make people acknowledge, you know, we didn't we didn't have access to the, the VA loan. They started redlining. They did so many things to keep us from being successful business wise. And when you look at um, the world today, most of the wealth was passed down to real estate. And that was the area of business that we weren't allowed to be in in the 40s and 50s and 60s when the bulk of the wealth of the United States was garnered and generated by people. We weren't privy to all of that. So you, you just have to educate yourself about so many different things. It's just mm -hmm. not what the books in school. It's about all the other things in life that come your way. So I have a different kind of perspective. Degrees are very important, but I think there's some other things you need to get outside of those schools and colleges. Yeah. I, and I, I agree with you because, um, you know, I graduated from college and yeah, I probably use a lot of, you know, in terms of the communication skills and different yeah. things like that. Um, you know, I, I used, uh, and still use, uh, you know, currently, but, uh, as the executive director for the boys and girls club in Mount Vernon for 27 years, um, I learned to work. Right. Um, and I learned to, raise resources for for my organization to build my organization up in every capacity i you know you know that was mm -hmm. available to me and and then when i when i retired and started to think about entrepreneurship you know to think about communication in a different way to share in in my experiences as a motivational speaker or, or consultant um so you know, I didn't know a lot about monetizing me, mm -hmm. right? So, I, you know, I spent about a year, you know, going through a whole process on how to build a business, right? And then how to grow the business, uh, you know, and and unfortunately it was during the pandemic, right? So you could, now I'm starting to see some progress of it, but mm -hmm. you, you're absolutely right. I think that along with education, we should talk about inventions. We we should talk about entrepreneurship. We should talk about what is have a business in products or services, mm -hmm. right? Uh, exactly. 
and 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 how do we navigate social media and how can that impact your your ability to be a great entrepreneur so there's one thing i want to read real quick i had i was looking at it before the show started it says uh next time you see a tall black boy tell him he looks like an entrepreneur and an uh an attorney an influencer an analyst an accountant a ceo not just a ball player black boys can excel at at all things not just sports you know but but that's so true i mean listen um i don't think like um when you see him one statement would affect him that way it's how much what are they doing outside of the sport because look kareem one of the tallest guys ever he's one of the sharpest guys walking on the planet jim jones i have a lot of friends that are 610 611 yeah they use sports to uh, uh as a platform to get into so many other things outside of the sport and so it's it's not a bad thing to be an athlete but we got to be student athletes mm. not just athletic students we got to be student athletes and sometimes that's where the mentoring mentoring that, that you're doing and the mentoring that people are doing is hey man there are other things because when i represented players i told them uh you got to take your first contract as if it's your only contract don't go out and put yourself in a lifestyle that you can't maintain so your first contract you need to set yourself up most of us didn't have houses get your house get your mom a house get comfortable get comfortable with that then the next contract okay you can step it up but you can't approach this thing as if uh you know you're going to make this money the rest of your lives and our lives are backwards we make so much money then it goes whew. so if you <laughs> went smart in these 10 or 12 years where you made money uh that's where you see a lot of guys uh, get into trouble but unfortunately a lot of the guys don't have mentors uh, they have people that handicap. No, I do it all for you. Don't worry about it. I'm going to do everything for you. That handicaps you. So I tell guys, always know how to reach your financial statement. Be able to look at it. Be able to understand. Even if you don't know, if you ask for it, they won't, they'll be less likely to cheat if they think you're looking at it. I say, tell them you want to see it. Don't give up power return. Sign your checks. Do your stuff. So I say that to athletes and ball players all the time. But it's it's, it's uh, for 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 me that's that that statement is definitely true. Tell me it can be something else, but I don't think that statement alone can handicap them because if they're getting fed other stuff outside of school and in their homes and in other places from a mentor, um, I think they they can look at that and laugh too, and they'll be the one to respond. Yeah, but you know, I want to be a doctor or I want to be a lawyer. You know, I want to own a team. I don't want to play. I want to own the team. You yeah. Know that? That would be my comeback. I teach them to do. If they say you want to be, yeah, I want to be an athlete too. But when I retire, I want to own the team. And, yeah. and and fortunately, they can point to some examples. When I was coming, you couldn't. They can point to Michael. They can point to Matt. They can point to some of the guys that had pieces of a team. You know. So mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. No, that's awesome, man. So back to ball, man. Um, I yes, remember. Sir. I remember. Uh, you know, of course, I remember you at Duquesne, right? And you know, I, I took some, you know, I had some abilities, but, you know, one of the things I took from you, man, I call when I think of Norm Nixon, I think of the shot because you did a weird thing when I was guarding you. Right. <laughs> so, you I know, I had a little, you know, no, you, well, you bumped me off, but, that, you know, that was cool, too. Right. And yeah. and, and I um, and, and I want to tell you, I call it the shot. Right. It's like. You know, because I I was able to block jump shots. You know, I had a little vertical and stuff like that. But you had that thing where you 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 lean back, or you can lean to the side. Now I used to add some of that stuff to my game. You know, I see somebody do something, I say, oh, you know what? I can do that too. I call it the shot. You know, uh, you know, I was always fascinated by your shot. You know, your ability to create space. You know, and to you know to move it back or to go sideways, man. Man, how do you develop that, man? Well, I'll tell you, I, it's, it, it, you know what? Again, we talk about death. Uh, one of my guys I played with at Duquesne. Uh, do you remember Jose Champagne? I do. Okay. Jose, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Jose and I played together for one year. And Jose was about, you know, Jose was about six, three and a half, physical, you know, 210, 215, you know, just aggressive. Foul, you know, if you got by him, he was gonna foul. He's one of those guys. If you got by him, he was gonna foul you. You box him out, he's gonna come over your back, take the ball. So, 
he was a freshman. So I said, man, I asked no way I'm going to let this freshman come in here and do me like this. So invariably, we had to play against each other because we played together. We would never lose in the gym. We were going to pick up game. So he, he and I used to have to pick. So, I, you know, I started lifting my waist, man, because I had to get strong to get this cat <laughs> off of me. So uh, I learned how to go real fast, hit him to knock him back. Then I would jump back. So I developed that from playing against him. That's why when I started playing with guys my size, it was a little easier because he was so strong. I mean, I literally used to have to dribble with him full speed and just hit him to knock him back that way. I would jump the other way to shoot. So I'd hit him <laughs> and jump back. And that's literally how I learned it, you know, because I wouldn't have been able to get my shot off if I had just tried to just beat him and shoot the ball. So I had to create distance, knock him off balance, then shoot my shot. So I developed that. I tell I told him that when I saw him, I said, "Man, you wanted to, you helped me get to the NBA because <laughs> I could get my shot off. I knew yeah. I could get my shot off, and that's how it started. You know, oh, we, wow. you know, uh, necessity is the mother of creativity. You know, that's right. I had to do it to get my shot off, man. Or I never would have got my shot off. So he made me. He laughs about that all the time. You know." And I had yeah. another guy because, you know, they didn't encourage us to lift weights. I had another guy. He ended up passing away, Pi Karski. He was a big guy on my team. Pi Karski lift weights. So I used to lift weights with him all the time. So I used to work out with those guys. And uh, they definitely, and there it is. I'm leaning all the time on my shot. <laughs> but, you know, you was you were accurate. I mean, you, you, you created something that was, uh, you know, special, man. I mean. Oh, I would with, jump back. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, oh. Because I was, I was like going up well, for the I did shot. did that to you guys, man? You thought oh, you were yeah, going to block just... my shot? I, I knew you could jump. You thought you was going to block my shot, man? Of course I thought I could. <laughs> <laughs> Until oh, you God. did it. <laughs> you got to go pull the stats up to see what I did, see what I did to you guys. <laughs> no, you did it. You did. You did. You know, and it's I'm like. Huggers too, because Huggers, you just tried to. You know, you're just going straight up. And I'm going straight up with you, you know, all of a sudden you're like. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, like, oh, I like that. Yeah. I like that. I like that. I started adding that to my shot too, man. Oh, man. Look, it worked. And yeah, I it did work. Guards, I used to tell them, man, you, well, in today's game, you don't have to do it. My game, you had to create distance because guys could hit you. Oh, yeah, definitely. They could hit you hard too. Yeah, oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, man. great great career at Duquesne. Before I get off Duquesne, uh, great career at Duquesne, right? And before I get off of it, I, I I have to tell you this, um, and it's one of, the, you know, I always believe I was going to be a pro, but one of the things that helped me uh, with that, John, Coach John Senecola. Yep. Now he was your coach. Exactly. Right. So the year you left, he retired, and no, he be coach one more year. He one more year. Him. One more year, and he became a Converse <clears throat> rep. Mm-hmm. He's a rep for Converse, and he was coming down to uh, to Morgantown to see if West Virginia would take on Converse, of course, which we did. Uh, we 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 came, uh, you know, we wore Converses, mm -hmm. uh, but you know when uh, what we were practicing, and he asked Coach, I think it was Coach, um, if he could speak to me after practice so I, the coach says yes and then he calls me over after practice and he comes over he said uh he said to me do you know norm nixon i was like what i said of course i <laughs> i know norm he played for you right like that and he said uh yes um do you know where norm is now right i said he's with the lakers he's like yes and you could be in the nba too right That's he said true. one yeah. Yes, he said, he said, one thing about Norm, and, you know, I always go hard, right? But if something was easy, right? You know how players, you just kind of lay back. They the level the competition. Right. And, and so he said to me, man, you should never lose a race. You should never lose a suicide. You should never lose a 17. Norm never lost a 17. He yeah. never lost. He never lost a suicide. He was always in first place. You have the potential to do it. There's no such thing as practice. It's always the game. 
Now, how about I just told a little player that all the time? I say, you're the fastest on the team? He said, yes. I say, you should never lose a whistle sprint then. If I watch you practice, you should win every time. You know, and, and, and I had that mentality. I had that mentality coming from, <clears throat> from high school. And just like I say, you walk into the pros and you practice against everybody, you outrun everybody every time. They're going to pay attention to you. That's right. Mm-hmm. You, know, you win every 17. I won every whistle sprint. You know, yeah. even when we retired, I was winning. So you, 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 and then, but also too, man, people talk about leaders and respect. That's how you get respect. You know, yeah. you can't, hey, I want you to respect me. No, you earn respect. And That's when right. They see you working and you say something to somebody, they can't say nothing. Not That's saying right. you're never going to make mistakes. We all going to make mistakes. We all do all that stuff. But if you're putting in the work, they can't say nothing. That's right. It's like, yeah. I tell you before, they drafted uh, Brad Davis ahead of me. And I'm sure the plan was Brad would start, I would come off the beat, uh, bench because they had just gotten swept by Portland with Johnny Davis, who we played against. Mm-hmm. Johnny Davis left my, after our junior year. You know, Lionel Hollis, Bill Walton, they they swept the Lakers. So the Lakers was like, we got to get some speed back here. So they drafted <laughs> me and Brad Davis. And so, you know, at that time, if you're playing like this with the guard they draft ahead of you, he's going to get the job. You have to be like this. Mm-hmm. You have to be like this. Every time I played one on one, I tried to score, and every time I guarded him, I tried to lock him up. I wanted to be no question who was supposed to play. You can't leave it up to like mm, I don't know if he, ah, uh, maybe he might not. No, 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 no. It has to be like this. You don't mess around with that, yeah. especially in my my time too. You know, you yeah. can't come and play as good as somebody. You want to make sure, you want to make sure that there was going to be no question about who's supposed to play. Right. And then you're not know, coming to New York. Like I say, all you New York guys. He's <laughs> oh, you, you play down in the cotton field. Dude. You play in the cotton field. Yeah, that's why I play. Y'all got high bills. I say, yeah, that, yeah, that's why I play. Okay, let's roll the ball out there. I'll talk to you after the game. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but uh, I took his words. No. Yeah. It, and I true. accelerated, I accelerated that that year. I just exploded on the, I just exploded on the scene, you know, because I didn't take any time off. That's right. right. He, yeah. he used to tell me. This is another thing he used to tell me because I did have the ability to joke around and play around, and then kind of lock in when I had to. He called me off. God damn it, Norman, you got to stop <laughs> playing because they can't play around like you, and then turn it back on. Stop playing around. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> So I stopped. So I stopped doing it. He got me <laughs> early with that one. Stop playing around. They can't do that. So yeah. Like, okay, coach, I got you. you know? And I I even told, that was one thing, man, I, I coached uh, at Marvin High School for as an assistant coach for a little while. And I had Ben Gordon. Right. And Ben could do whatever he wanted to do in high school. I mean, to them guys. And he wouldn't do the drill like you're supposed to do the drill. And I was like, look, Ben. I need you to do the drill like it's supposed to be done. Because if you think, if you do that, then everybody's going to look at mm-hmm. you and they're going to do that. Right. So I need you to do it straight. And, and of course he went down and did what he want. Cause he was Ben, you know, he came back down, looked at him. Right. I looked at him. I, I was like, I know you heard what I said. Right. So then he did the drill like he was supposed to do it. And then they was like, well, who is this guy that Ben's going to turn around and read? He could say that to him, <laughs> you know, uh, but you know, you see what he but he was game. able to do. Yeah, Look, man, the players know if you played the game. You know that that is one of my biggest gripes about these leagues these days. They hire guys that coach us has never played the game, and when they are, oh, he lost the locker room. Yeah, you lose the locker room because the guys figure out you don't know what you're talking about real soon, mm-hmm. yeah, especially on a professional level. You know, yeah. we've been too, too much to, too much to have a guy that stopped playing like in junior high school. And then he looked at some film, and they say all of a sudden he knows because. The Bex X and O's sometimes at the end of the game, uh, no X and O's. <laughs> you know, yeah. you come out and say, put the ball in the hand of the guy that's going to win the game, and everybody else just be ready to shoot if he can't get his shot off. All this pass to him, set a pick, pass to him, not pass it over there. It's like, no, there's like two or three opportunities the ball is going to get stolen. Put the ball in the hand of the guy you want to score. That's right. And when you play off of that, everybody else just be ready to shoot. And, and, yeah. and this is a true story because uh, DJ told me this one. They were playing, and, uh, you know, I forgot who was coaching. Talking about, okay, we're going to pass here. We're going to pass. What are we going to do? They said, Larry said, no, 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 man. 
give me the ball. <laughs> I'm over in the pick and roll. You be in the corner. You be in this corner. If I can't get it out, just be ready to shoot the ball. <laughs> give me the yeah. ball to hear me. <laughs> oh yeah. man, you know. So so from Duquesne to the Lakers, right? Talk about those worlds. You know, going from didn't want to go, didn't want to go, did not want to go to Los Angeles. I wanted wow. to stay on the East Coast so my family could see me play. I wanted to go to Atlanta, and I really thought um, I thought Boston was going to draft me because I, I this might have still been happening when you were playing. Playing Red Arback used to have a camp in the summertime where he invited seniors to play. Mm. During it was during their rookie camp too. You work a camp, you play at night. The rookies were in their rookie camp, but we worked the camps so every night. We were always play. So I went up going into my senior year. And um, so instead of me playing with the college players, he took me out of that and had me play with their rookies. Because the college players used to have a scrimmage, and then their, their rookies were scrimmage. So he took me out of that game and put me in the game with his rookies. And I played point and all the people were coming up to me, go, man, you're going to make the team. You're going to make the team. But I was still in college. So I'm, I, when I got back, I'm like, okay, Boston probably going to draft me. They draft mm. Maxwell, but <laughs> didn't go wrong. <laughs> no, they didn't go wrong. Boston going to draft me and Willis Reed was going to draft me. And, uh, I ended up falling. Uh, I was like the last player picked in the first round, but I went to the Lakers. I'm like, man, I don't want to go all the way out there. It's too far. <laughs> and then I flew out like in um, like October or something before training camp. You know, I'm coming from Pittsburgh where it was already probably 10 degrees. <laughs> and you're out here, everything was green. There were flowers. I said, I might like this. <laughs> and I'm still here. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's interesting because uh, Red Auerbach was a color commentator for uh, a nationally televised game, West Virginia versus Notre Dame. And I, I, I scored 40 points that night. And after the game, he was like, man, I've never seen nothing like that. Man, you dunking and, you know, all that kind of stuff like that, man. Little guy jumping all over the gym, you know, and stuff like that, man. And so I thought I was going to be drafted by, by, the Celtics. By, by the Celtics. And what ended up happening, they made a trade and they brought in Robert Parrish, Right, so oh, you know I ain't getting drafted by them. They brought up Robert Parrish, DJ. and and then they end up getting no DJ wasn't there yet, but uh, he may have come. But then they Mikel they brought in. He they drafted Mikel, right? So you know I'm not getting drafted to Boston. I go I go to the Nets. I fall to the I fall to the Nets, and um, so yeah, we were all thinking we going to Boston. I mean, you know, like yeah. hey, Red Al back, love me, you know, <laughs> but and, it's and business. Blue. Believe it or not, the uh, the uh, scout for the uh, Lakers was Jerry Cross at that time, who ended up being the uh -huh. general manager with all those teams with Michael and Pippen and those guys. He's always like, come up to me, know him, you know him, the reason you're out here. <laughs> he <takes laughs> my career. Yeah. We only had Jerry around. But Jerry wow. was a scout for the Lakers. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, – so you get to Los Angeles, man. I, you know, I played in. Of course, I played against the Lakers, right? It, mm -hmm. It's a. I, you heard me mention Showtime earlier, right? Oh, <laughs> so, form, man. oh yeah. <laughs> so I, I come in the forum, and I'm like, "What is going on here?" Because you know, I was playing. The Nets was home court was in Rutgers University. You know, so yeah. so I'm you scatter away. Yeah, I'm scatter away. down there. <laughs> So I go in, man, I see the forum. I'm like, oh, what is going on here? You know, it's another whole world. I mean, yeah. you how do you manage that? Play you playing well and manage that social, you well, know. The thing about it is, I mean, I mean, people saw that series, and you know, my son actually paid me in that series. Yeah. But, but the the thing about our team at that to the championship playing. I played two years before Magic and Coop and all those and Jim Jones, and those guys changed that took us over the hump to win the championships. I mean, you manage it because you play so many games. Uh, and ultimately you want to win championships, you know, and you can't have a uh, silly, silly team and win championships. So we were a very serious group of guys. So we won in 1980, man. I was 24. Magic was uh 
23. Coop was like 23. Jamal was 26. So we were young guys beating all these veterans. You know how that is. I mean, mm-hmm. we're like 23, 24 year old guys running these guys out of the gym. So it was, we were a very serious team. So we were about winning. Uh, the beauty of it was, uh, Jerry Buss, when he bought the team, he was the first guy that uh, incorporated sex, entertainment, sports, playboy owner. And fortunately, with our style of play, fast, up-tempo game, and we won championship. And being in Los Angeles, so everybody came to the games. You know, this was a hub of the entertainment business, all the movie stars, all the record stars. Everybody wanted to be in the forum. So you could come to the forum, man. You'll see all the people you saw in the movie last night sitting on the court. So after a while, you get used to it. You know, you yeah, to after a while. And because they come into, they wanted to see us, so they come in to see us. They were trying yeah. to get in the forum club to see us. So it was kind of, the script was flipped a little bit. Yeah. So it was it was, it was an interesting thing. And, and, and you, you had to have discipline not to get caught up. A lot of people came up and got caught up out here. And yeah. that's just like in the city. You can go to New York and get caught up. You know, the smaller that's towns, true. maybe not as much as the big city. You can go to Chicago. Here was Hollywood and entertainment, so you can get caught up into that. So, so in all that world, that crazy world, right? You come up with a a diamond in the rough, man, and been married how long? <laughs> been married forty years, man. <laughs> so you with me? We, forty we, years. We, yep. we forty years in August. We, last yep. August we were forty years, right? This past August, and so forty. 40 yeah. Yeah. So forty years and. And uh, so talk, talk about that whole, well, you know, just similar values, man. You know, I was a Southern boy. I knew I always wanted a family. You know, I knew I always wanted those things. Um, you talk about our upbringing. Debbie's from Texas. She just happened to be in, in, in the fine arts, the world performing arts. But um, we wanted the same things. And, you know, I'm, I'm a guy, I'm a country boy. So I grew up cutting grass, taking care of the yard, doing all this in the projects, <laughs> not in a home. <laughs> but uh, but I, I, I do all those things, man. You know, I cook, I wash dishes, I took care of my kids. I, all those things that I wanted to do because I, I know those things are important when you're nurturing the family. You know, one of my friends used to ask me all the time, has a little money. You know, my wife come in, I get up, I go pick up at the airport at one o'clock. Man, why are you going to the airport at one o'clock? You can send a car. I said, but that's what that's what we do from Georgia. <laughs> we from the airport. Oh, and we let me let me correct food. you. Let me correct you. I may live in in New York, <laughs> but at heart, yeah, I'm a Southern boy. I'm you know well, I'm from you know, North Carolina. But, but that's not you know that's not uniquely Southern. I mean you you have the Southern hospitality <laughs> kind of thing people say, but you know there there is some truth to it. And I tell you where the truth comes out. It shows. I mean I play with teams. I'm not calling names and stuff. You can tell a guy from the South because. Uh, if it was Thanksgiving and you had rookies on the team, you know they don't have nowhere to go. You know, mm-hmm. guys from other places just like, okay, I'll see you Thursday. I'll see, I'll see you guys next week. You know, the Southern guy and you know me and a couple of guys, hey man, what are you doing? You know, man, you come over my house to eat. You can see that, right? That was a, because I guess there was a little more distrust in New York about not letting people get close to you. It could be the city life. We didn't grow up in that city life. You know, we grew up in a place where if you were hungry, you could get something to eat. Um, well, I'm still I'm still a Southern boy. I mean, because well, you, I mean, oh, you, oh, every, every South, summer, man. every summer before high school, I was in North Carolina. My kids with my went to Georgia. My kids <laughs> went to Georgia to my mother's house and stayed with <laughs> Because it, it's, it's something about that. Because you're going to get it. Boy, get your feet off the table. Don't go in my refrigerator without washing your hands. My mother, you go in the refrigerator without washing your hands, man, you might get backhand. <laughs> or walk in there and some of your friends in the refrigerator moving her food around. Because st- <laughs> I still got some of those things. You know, I walk in the house, my son be in the house, his friend, someone, his friend, move my stuff out the refrigerator. I'm like, man, are you out of your mind? I said, no, if you don't wait on this boy and get him out of my refrigerator. So I got some of that. They laugh at me all the time. <laughs> Uh, see, see, my wife said Lowe's boy Jr. is a southern boy for sure. <laughs> yeah. No, I laugh yeah. about that stuff all the time. But, yeah, but yeah. Too, like they ask me sometimes, and this is true for me, I think. Why didn't I get caught up so badly out here? Because I always thought about I never would embarrass my mother because they put a big thing on me one time. Oh, he's doing drugs, he's doing this. And you know, you wanna you wanna 
answer people when they say something. I got to the point like, man, I'm not giving an answer to all these people. I called my mother. I said, mom, this is what they're saying. This is what I do. I don't do that. If somebody said it to you, you have the right to cuss them out. <laughs> because that's not me. And, uh, and I'll never, you know, because I knew I would never embarrass her. So I yeah. think those things, those the, the fundamentals, because I was 17 when I left to go to college. By 17, I was who I was going to be. And I wasn't a follower, so nobody couldn't, you know, I definitely been at the, co the parties with cocaine and all these different things all around. You know, it was easy for me to walk away from it because it wasn't who I was, you know, nor who I am. So it was easy for me to do that. And I, I always say, you know, coming from Macon, Georgia is part of the reason I, who I am. I am who I am. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it looked like uh, we're having a little technical uh, situation. You you're frozen. I think you're frozen. I, I can still hear you. And Yeah. I may have to jump out and jump back in. Uh, let's see here. Um, I don't know why I'm spinning here, but uh, yeah, to me, you frozen too. Uh, well, we can refresh. Let me see. Are you back? I see, I see you now. Yeah, I had to switch places. I don't know what happened <laughs> down there. <laughs> yeah, but um, so talk to me uh about what it was like to win the championship, man. Well, well, uh, uh, this is the best, best feeling, feeling in the world. world. I mean, <laughs> when we, when we, won, we won the first time, time uh, uh, I never, I never forget. forget. 
Well, you're so first of all, you're so tired once you do it. Because that's a hard plan. Five of the best guys playing against five of the best guys, man. And you know, that's intensity, mentally, physically, every kind of emotionally. I was, I was so, so tired, tired that once we did the parade, parade, I, I went, went out of town, town about, about three, three days. days. I was, I was laying, laying on the beach, and I, I kind of looked, looked up, and, up and, I said, and I said, man, man you one of the baddest bad guys, guys in the world. world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, oh, man, man you were the baddest five in the world. So it's so good. Because that's what we play for, man. We play for championships. Yeah, then you won two. I won two. Yeah, man. You know, and um, yeah, man, I, I, I tell you, I, I loved you guys at that time, man, uh, in, in terms of, you know, the run and gun. Because, you know, that's what, we, you know, when you were younger, man, you like to get up and down the floor. Run and gun. And, and, yeah, put that, put that ball up. Jack, 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 Jack McKinnon, McKinnon put, us put us together. together. Jack McKinnon, McKinnon was, was the one who was assistant coach in Portland when, when you saw Bill, Bill, Bill and all that stuff with the offense. The offense. It was mm-hmm. kind of kind um, a... Um, it was a freelance, freelance offense, offense, but it was a method, method to the match. match. There were tweets, you know, the back doors. doors. All that, All stuff, that stuff was natural, natural when we came when we down came court. court. You know how you know when how people play? Lows. We had an automatic game. Like, like, so we had so people scared, scared to over players. players. But again, you know, you got Kareem on the box. Man, we got in trouble. We gave it to Kareem, man. Yeah, no, I, no, I like that. Don't let nobody fool you. you. Yeah, they gave that stretch. It's like we call it fist. It's like, like cap. But, but the beautiful, beautiful thing, thing about, about Green, though, he could, he could pass. pass. So if you, yeah, watch, you watch the, watch the, the old, old plays, plays, you'll see Maddie cut, cut six went to the corner, iron to the top, the key. Tap, tap with distributing that thing. Think about it. He was going to hit you in the hand with rhythm. So he was going to have to make a catch. catch. You know, when I got traded away with the series. You open, you open the pass, you man. You got to, you know, you got to be a Michael Irvin, Irvin catch, catch the ball. So <laughs> cap, cap, hit, hit, hit right in rhythm, rhythm, boom, boom. back door class. Me and Silk had different, different things they did. They did. You know, you know I, 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 I tell you this, you understand this technically. You know how you hit the center and the floor goes back door. Jamal and Cap, but Kareem, they wouldn't get the pass. He hit them on the second pass all the time because as a basketball player, with a man Back door. Back door. You know, you, you know, jump, you jump initially. Initially. But then if they don't pass, pass it, you relax, relax again. again. So right. cap, cap, boom, boom. boom. Miss that, that one, bam, bam. hit it on the stack, nail, nail, nail every, every time. time. So wow. little, little things, things like that, that with little nuances that, that we developed as a team where we could get people, no play call, no nothing, just off the board. Wow. Well, I love Yeah, I enjoyed – Man, I enjoyed watching you guys, man. It was fun. I yeah, mean, yeah. literally, literally. We enjoy playing, playing and having, having you watch, watch us. us. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather be playing with you, but, uh, you know, that was a whole different. Now, I now I did, I end up in the cl- with the Clippers, right? Mm-hmm. And the I want you to talk a little bit about the trade. And, and, and uh, I was with the Clippers when you got traded. Oh, I didn't, oh, know, I didn't that. know that. Yeah, and I think you had hurt your knee, right? Be- well, not, no, no, I, no I, I, didn't, I didn't. I did, I did hurt, hurt my knee while I was with the Clippers, but not when I got traded. That well, was a couple, couple years, years later. later. Yeah. Um, but, but it was, it was like, like going, going from, from look, I went, I, I, I got traded. I, 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 I left, left a team, team that, that was usually 60 and 22 to a team that, that was 22 and 60. And it was so disheartening. So the one thing uh, I, I had, had to. to uh, come to grips with i had to just play for myself and playing for myself meaning i had to just play hard all the time for myself because we weren't going to win the game so i just had had to represent represent myself myself play hard hard, play play well well. i could could do do anything anything i wanted wanted to do we're going to win the game game. but i so so my mentality mentality, had to i had to really really figure out who I was as a player, player individual, individual because just, you go into a arena, arena 2,000, 3, 3,000 people, 4,000 people. I was playing with form with 17, 5, 5, 5, 5 every, every game. game. You know, you know, capacity. And everywhere we, we went, went capacity, capacity. people, people came, came to see us play. play. And to be with the team, we had no resources. Right, right the danger of the, the NBA. NBA. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was there. So uh, I know, I know. 
You relate. You relate. <laughs> yeah, I can relate. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted, you know, when they said, that, oh, yeah, we, we uh, traded for Norm Nixon, you know, I was thinking, like, man, I'm going to play with Norm. You know, I was looking forward to it. And uh, for some reason, man, they let me go. Eddie, Eddie Jordan, Jordan was part of, part of that, that trade. trade. Yes. That's, That's why. why. Yes. 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 It was me, so it was me and Eddie. Eddie. We came to the Clippers for Swin, Nader, Bar the rights to Bar Bar's guy, and somebody else. But the Lakers won the back of the season there. And, 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 you know, they got Byron, Byron in the back, in the back of the season. Season. Oh. Yeah, yeah. No, no that was – uh. Yeah, NBA is interesting, but you had a great career, man, and um, you you did your thing, um, and Thank I you. enjoyed watching you play, man. You know, yeah, with a little his history. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I uh, yeah, I love it because it was good, man. It was good basketball, man. It was fun. Um, yeah, it was just it was just exciting, and then uh, uh, D D became like a. Uh, you know, a, what do you say? Uh, D became such a, a strong Laker fan. I mean, even though he was at, <laughs> even though he was at the game with a, a Nick hat on, you know, or a Yankees hat yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you well, know, you, you have, have a tendency to, to, to root for people that you know. Like now they ask, who are my favorite team? My favorite, favorite team is usually you, teams that have some, some of my, of my friends, friends kids playing, the guys that I've known, the growth. They grew, they grew up, up around, around me, me, coaches that I know. So you just look for those guys to do well. I mean, you still have your loyalty to the Lakers, play with the Lakers and the Clippers. You always hope they can have great season. But outside of that, you know, you go play, you go watch guys that you watch grow up or coaches you watch grow up, football and basketball, because I like football as well. So, um, Yeah, no, no that's, that's, that's a good thing, man. Um, you know, but talk talk a little bit about the, uh, you know, Debbie and the family, the kids and stuff like that growing up and what they, what they're accomplishing, you know, now. Well, you, well, you know, know, my, my oldest, oldest is an actor. He's been, been doing, doing it for a while. while. I've been playing the series, series Snowfall, Snowfall. Uh, as a young boy, that was him playing Whitney's son in The Bodyguard. Most people don't realize that was the same one. Uh, my daughter... You know, my wife and I, we have a huge nonprofit, the Dance Academy. We have a middle school. We just named my daughter the executive director there. So she works with her there. She's blessed me with two beautiful granddaughters. My youngest is, um, you know, he's out acting, working, doing stand-up, believe it or not. So he's been on the road a lot. So he's trying to find his way in that world, you know. Have you run into, like, J.B. Smooth? He's another mom running guy. Oh, I know, oh, I know, I know Jay, but I didn't know he was from Alberta. And I do know JB. I see him all the time. Yeah, I know he was from Alberta. We were all well. He's a little bit younger than D and I because we were all in the boys and girls. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we got a got a question down there. Let's see. see. Uh, the, uh, the pressure of the day is much, much more and difficult. Different, different from, from the all the time. time. Social media has made young people put their self-worth in how many likes and followers they have, which is very true. And it is different. I mean, we talk about it all the time. You know, what would it be like if we had to, if we had cell phones and uh, we had social media? We don't know how we would react. We, we think we wouldn't have all our business online like these kids do. They put everything online. Nothing sacred anymore. And um, it is tough. How to navigate it is, I think we're still, people are still trying to figure out because now you got social media, now you're going to have AI that's going to be coming around. So it's going to be very difficult. <laughs> I'm He's back. Moving around. He's moving around. I'm moving around. Yeah. You know, hey, technology is good, but it's just, it ain't perfect. This is true. <laughs> Uh, we've learned to make some adjustments, man. But uh, no, no, uh, it's a different world. I mean, can you imagine uh, you were playing and had to deal with social media? Uh, that's what I'm saying. You don't know. You'd like to think you would handle it different, but we might be just like these guys. Everywhere we go, we online. and I'm over here. I'm big balling, posting everything. 
you know, that's detrimental, man. It, it, the lines between personal, private, and public have been blurred so badly. People think, and most and those people don't care about you. When you see those internet trolls, man, they go at people. Love you one day, they go at you the next day. So <laughs> that, that'll be very difficult to navigate. Yeah, but you know, but I, I do think that if we grew up in this world at this time, we probably would be able to navigate it. We would hope we would. <laughs> yeah, hope. I, well, I hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope. I hope we could do it. And um, yeah. you know, and so when you think about like, um, you you had a, a perfect uh, situation. Not only did you play and do great and won championships and stuff like that, but you've been around the Lakers for a lot of years, man. I mean, there's been <coughs> so many legends. I mean, of course, Jerry West and um, you know. Uh, you know, one of my, you know, favorites, Jerry West and Elgin Baylor. Of course, I met, I know Jerry. I met Elgin Baylor. You know, I met Wilt before. I mean, just so many great legends. I mean, when you think about, um, talk a little bit about that, being around that atmosphere with all those different types of uh, legends like that. And, and then talk about the life of, you know, particularly magic and, and then uh, you you around Kobe and and then now you talking about great players. I mean, Lakers, they went from um getting having Wilt to getting Kareem. I mean, you can't to oh, yeah. getting Shaq, you, you know, Shaq to getting Kobe. To, you know, it goes on. I mean, that's what expected out here. I mean, they expect you to win champions out championships out here. So they they have to spend the money to get those type of players or those type of stars because they got to put people in the seat. When you playing 3000 plus per ticket to sit on the floor, you better have some talent out there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it is, you know, for me, I'm just have to be part of that long legacy of players that went through there. But uh, when I first came here, like you say, when coming from uh, Duquesne and Pittsburgh and walk in the gym, I see Kareem, um, uh, Lou Hudson, Adrian Dantley, Ron Boone, mm. or Earl Tatum. I played with Earl. Earl was oh yeah, team. yeah, that's my buddy. You, know, you walking in, you're like, man. But <laughs> but in in my head though, it's like, okay, I got to go get me a job. <laughs> so, <laughs> I thought it's a lot different. I love being in the room with him, but I had my I had a job to do, man. I was coming out to try to play, so I was like, look, I'm focused on, you know, when when they call out the starting lineup, I want to be the point guard. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and you did that, man. You you played great yeah. too. And you deserve to play. You know, Thank you deserve you, the ball because you could ball, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So talk talk a bit a little bit about uh, you know, maybe man, I mean, always tragic, man. Kobe. Uh talk a little bit about know, Kobe, man. man. That, well, you know what? I had uh his last year I spent a little time with him. Um he was a big supporter of our academy, you know. And um, I, had, I had a chance to spend a little time. You know, of course, I knew his dad, Jelly Bean, because Jelly Bean yeah. that same thing with all the sale. I played against him, you know, and uh, Kobe and I had talked a lot over the last year about his relationship with his dad. You know, I was, you know, uh, you know, there are a lot of things that have been said about him. And I just used to always tell him, man, you know, your dad's your dad. Sometimes we always individual have to be bigger than in the situations and stuff like that. Whatever, whatever problem you have, you know with anybody in your family, particularly someone that close, you know, it's better to try to reconcile. And, if, and sometimes you have to be the bigger person to do stuff like that. So we had just been, been a lot of time talking about life, man. And um, when that happened, it, it really stung me. Mm. Um, I had just seen him at another event where I introduced him. Uh, and uh, we spent some time back, you know, uh, backstage, you know, I'd gone to his office a couple of times, sat and talked to him. So it was tragic because he was in a really, great space once he left sports he was a big advocate for women's sports he was a big advocate for for uh for just social social things social activity supporting this supporting this you know he had turned into that type of person you know philanthropic person so he seemed to be in like a really really good space and um and i'll say this and his wife said said this at the funeral she said um I'm sure she didn't mean she was happy that her baby girl was with him because they had that relationship because she played ball. Mm -hmm. And she just said, 
you know, God took her with him because it would have been very difficult for her to survive without her dad. Mm. I heard her say that once and it was like, wow. It's like, oof. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's crazy. You yeah. know, yeah, yeah I, I love it to see exactly. a, a person, you know, a play evolve, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because we are more than than basketball players. Yeah. You know, yeah, he was he was in a great space, man. That's what I can say from what I saw, you know, because I watched him on the court, you know, I watched his attitude on the court. And then after I had an opportunity to spend some time with him after he retired, I said, yeah, everyone go raise now, man, I'm done. So he was on his, another mission. I think his impact was going to be greater off the court yeah. than it was on the court with the things that he had started doing. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you 100 percent. I think he would been he would have been more popular in his uh after basketball I, I believe kobe is one of the few uh entertainers basketball players actors business people right you know very, i always right. I always, I always say that you know and and td jake said it you know a lot of people know how to get in the plane they know how to fly the plane right but they don't know how to land the plane right right and yeah. many of us as athletes we don't we don't know what the end is like, you know, no. but I, I think Kobe leaving, leaving when he, he knew what he wanted to do when he left, you mm -hmm. know, he had a good frame of mind about what was, what was his next journey? What was his next chapter, man? And that's what, that's what I loved about him. He's deep, a deep, deep thinker, you know, yeah. like a philosopher or something, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And, th and then, uh, finally, um and first of all i want to thank you for coming on man i appreciate it taking the time out your busy schedule well but, you weren't gonna let me not do it i said let me do this for my <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah I was, perseverance I was. perseverance brother it was yeah, cool yeah yeah I, but i tell you once i had the chance i was gonna do it now go hour and a half man <laughs> on my sunday oh <laughs> uh, yeah i know i know man i, I apologize I, like that. i say man i i always remember your game i love your game you know, like you, you were, but I guess you was three years behind me. You were fresh when I was a senior. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, man, this little guy right here, I liked your game. So I always, I always kept an eye on you. Well, I appreciate career. that. <laughs> yeah, I, did. I always yeah. watch, I watched your career because I want to see what you're going to do because your trajectory was definitely there. Yeah. I went to, I, you know, I started off with, they not bad now, but when I got with them, they were bad. You know, yeah. Jersey. Cleveland Clippers, yeah. they they were all bad at the time, man. So yeah. it, it, I was in a no win situation. If I had gotten to a better situation, you it's know, all better time, man. It's a lot of luck. I mean, you got to put yeah. in the work, like they say. Uh, luck is just preparation, meeting opportunity. You was prepared, you just never got a great opportunity. That's you know, right. Yeah, so. yeah. So you didn't and get that luck. You yeah, know, so you do have to be lucky. You know, you fall yeah, in the right situation. It's luck, and it's it's all of it. It's all of it. You know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, finally, you get, you got um, I, I did some things in the past with with LeBron. Um, he did a, a thing a few years back called the battleground. And I was the coach for the New York team. We they, they always say New York and Chicago, the two the greatest basketball players. And so at the time, battleground was a one on one uh, experience where, you know, the best top 25 people in the, in the world played against each other for become the best one-on-one -on -one player in the world, best one-on-one -on -one player in, in the United States. And they asked LeBron if he would do it. And he said, I'm not a one-on-one -on -one player. I'm a team player. So they created New York versus Chicago Kings of the court. And LeBron hosts the whole thing. I was the coach of it. And so I got a chance to spend some time uh, with LeBron. It was an amazing experience, man. I had a great time with them. I mean, this guy was, I, I seen him when he won, he was in New Jersey, me and JB Smooth, I was with JB. He was the host of uh, uh, Sports, Sports Illustrator's Persian of the Week, Persian of the Year. And LeBron was, it, and Kareem, were they honored Kareem there, he was there as well. And, uh, you know, you, you meet somebody and then maybe they don't, re, they don't remember you. You know, I met LeBron some years ago and then we were, went to his, uh, me and JB went in, walked in his, uh, his suite he had there, uh, and he turned around and he seen JB 
and he looked behind me, him and he saw me. And he was like, oh my God, it's coach. You know, like that. And, and then he, he he went behind me, behind JB and just grabbed me, started hugging me. Man, what's up, man? What's going on? What are you doing? You know, so talk a little bit about LeBron before we get off here, man. And well, LeBron, uh, you know, I, I, I think LeBron, look, he's going to go down as one of the greatest of all time. I mean, and, and one of his longevity, I mean, it's legendary the amount of money he spends taking care of himself. And it's obvious because he's still playing at a high level after 20 years, you mm -hmm. know, and I think that's good. We, we, we thought Kareem's record would be never be broken, but LeBron did it. So longevity is the one thing um, that makes that possible because the average is about three or four years. You know, mm -hmm. you play 13 to 14 years at a certain level. That's incredible. So what he's done has been incredible. Mm -hmm. Today's players have a platform that's huge with millions, with social media and uh, all the things, way they can get the word out. They can say something, 40, 50 million people are here before they wake up the next morning. I think these players and LeBron in particular are guys that have used that platform for, for, for good things, for social change. Um, so I admire what those guys have done in that space. When you look at the school he's starting, the amount of money he gives back, uh, mm. speaking out on issues, talking about issues and stuff. So I think he's been one to forget the basketball. He's been a guy that's used that platform for the social benefit for a lot of us, you know, and I admire that about him in addition to what he's done on the court. So he's one of those guys that are in the forefront that's doing stuff, that's speaking up and talking about things. Yeah. Well, yeah. Norm, man, you one of my favorite ball players. You a legend, man. And I, I want again, I want to say thank you for coming on, man. You know, and um, man, you blessed me tonight. I'm gonna say uh, one thing before I go. I saw someone that kept sending up the question about who is the best uh who is the best guard I ever played against. And uh for me, it was always the guards where the offenses were we're built around and that would be your boy Gus because mm -hmm. he was the um he was the scorer for that team. So I had to run all picks, you know, Jack <laughs> Sigma, Lonnie Shelton, Paul <laughs> Silas, these guys banging on me. I spent the whole game running all picks with my little butt <laughs> trying to dodge. So Gus was very difficult. And a guy like Isaiah, uh, who the offense was built for. Um in my my time, most point guards won the scores like they are today. You know, they were distributors and they did score. But Gus, mm -hmm. uh, Isaiah, they were two of the guys at that time that had offenses developed around him. So those guys were the toughest guys to play against. Wow. Man, man, I want to say thank you again, man. Appreciate you. And um, but what did my wife say? <laughs> then we're in the era of crybabies. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, she's putting up, she getting her questions in. Hey, she asked, What about Steph? Probably the greatest shooter that ever hit the court. Oh, you know, he yeah. He'll go down as that. Unbelievable. Yeah, that's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, and shooter. I think uh, when you seen, I know when you went back home and stuff like that, and then when I went back home, we're no longer playing, whether it was, whether it was college or high school, and we go back home, right? Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, you know, we were shooting that, we were shooting them shots from everywhere, man. We, we, we could just ball out, you know, uh, we just didn't get an opportunity to do it. You know, what we knew we could do Yeah, we didn't at the highest practice. level. Yeah. I didn't practice those things, you know, right. I never practiced those shots, you know, and I tell people, we didn't shoot many threes. We averaged just as many points as these guys did because we got up and down the floor. That's right. Yeah. You know, so. <laughs> So, man, Norm, thanks a lot, man. Right. I, I right, appreciate Lose. you, man. Tell the family I said hello. For sure. All For right. Sure. And continue yeah. success, man. All right. You're welcome. All right. Okay. All right. So, yeah, I want to, again, I want to say thank you uh, to everybody who comes on each and every week uh, to to the Support the Blueprint podcast, man. Um, man, I love you guys, man. This, this was awesome. We had the great, the legendary norm nixon um who i admire as a person and a player and uh we had him on tonight i'm, I'm looking forward to next to next week um 
you know, uh, Ray Nagon, Nagon, and he's with the Yankees. Man, he's had an amazing story. And so I, I, I'll see you next week. And I want to leave you with, uh, before we close out, I want to show you just a little highlights of Norm Nixon playing basketball. And then it's going to be over right after Norm Nixon. Thank you. Love you guys. Remember what I say each week. Masterpiece. Give to Norman Nixon, Duquesne, a 22 foot jumper. Beautiful. Nixon penetrates an easy layup. Nixon against Scott. Turns on the juice. Shoots over Scott. And makes an 18 foot jump. They can't get it back to Walton, so it comes out in front to Derrick Smith. He drives the lane. He sees Kareem. He throws it around him and scores it, falling away to avoid the block. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of Lowe's Moore, the Blueprint Podcast. Stay connected and follow us at our website, www.lowesmore.com. That's L-O-W-E-S-M-O-O-R-E.com. You can also join the discussion on Twitter at Lowe's Moore and on Facebook at Lowe's Moore Jr. As always, thank you for pushing your mindset towards a better reality. This concludes the most thought-provoking portion of your day. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this podcast to stay fully up to date with everything we're up to. Until next time, be kind to yourself and each other. With the is a joke, I ain't buying it like I'm broke. Insufficient funds for insignificant